It's inside a square, right? Yeah. So, so I think he, he does, he, he puts that in there. And, oh no, he doesn't do minus, he does a plus one. He has a plus, he, this is what he has in there. That is what he has in there. And so since he did that, he's basically adding two, right? It's two x. So this becomes e to the minus x squared. And then, so that's a kind of, that's a kind of sneaky step. And then he says integration by parts n times yields. <laughs> Integration by parts n times. What? Which integration by parts exactly, my friend? Uh, what do you mean? Which which integration by parts? What what are you integrating by parts exactly here? Um, goodness. See, in order to do integration by parts, I need something I can actually integrate, you know? Well, I'm, I'm, you know, for the sake of saying something more interesting today, I'm just going to say dot, dot, dot equals, it'll remain a mystery for us at the moment. Um, but n-fold integration by parts gets us to allegedly, where did it go to? Oh, he eventually, he eventually he gets the two to the n. Well, um, ev eventually, he he finds his way, and this is not immediately after where we are, but after some time in calculation, he finds his way to two to the n times n factorial times the square root of pi. So, that that being the case, that means that you divide by the square root of that stuff to normalize it, right? So this gives us psi n of x equals to 1 over the square root of 2 to the n times n factorial times the square root of pi um, times my phi n, which was e to the minus x squared over 2 times the Hermite polynomial hn of x. These right here give you an orthonormal system for L2R. And I mean, these calculations are formidable, right? They are. I mean, it takes, you can do them. You just need some time and the willpower. But um, like it or not, these are the things you run up against as you're trying to solve Schrodinger's equations in, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's not, not coincidental. So you might, you might remember from your reading in Griffiths that he mentions Hermit polynomials like in his derivation of the Schrodinger equation in three dimensions, I think. Yeah, but the Lagrange polynomials came up in the hydrogen. Yep, the Lagrange polynomials in the hydrogen atom. Yep, yep. All right, so, um, all right, so I, I would say at the moment, like his, his definition, his, his, his definition of the Legendre polynomials and the Hermite polynomials has been very um, convenient in this terms of he's, he's defined them in terms of a generating function, which is super nice um, in terms of just like giving such a compact, concrete definition of what they are. Um, that may not be how actually they, these functions arise in applications. That might be something a little bit more, th th this is slick, is what I'm trying to say. Um, all right, here's what he says. In the preceding examples, the original sequence of functions is orthogonal but not orthonormal. Although the calculations involved might be complicated, it's always possible to normalize the functions to obtain an orthonormal sequence. It turns out that the same is possible if the original sequence of functions or in general sequence of vectors in inner product space is linearly independent, not necessarily orthogonal. The method of transforming such a sequence into an orthonormal sequence is called the Gram-Schmidt orthonormalization orthon 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 process. Um, 
so Graham and Schmidt are two different people, apparently. Jorgen Peterson Graham and Erhard Schmidt. Hey, I never knew their names before. What do you know? Um, and then he describes the process. And so if you look at the formulas he's writing there, that's exactly the formulas I was doing to the, um, you know, uh, the Legendre polynomials. Uh, I mean, so he's like, here's Graham Schmidt. You're given linearly independent set um, yn, right? Then you can you can construct orthonormal system wn by um, w1 equals y1, and then. Um, Well, orthonorm orthogonal and um, I guess he's using XN for orthonormal. Sorry, Audric, we were you, you haven't missed much when the, if Okay, cool. Cool. Ah, come on. So the X1 is, X1 is what I would have called, you know, W1 hat. You know, I mean, it is, it's literally Y1 over the norm of Y1, or you could, put, you could put W's there, right? It's probably better to put W's there because that's what you do in the next steps. I mean, you could put a W or a Y there logically, but, and then like, the kth one, wk, you take the kth y, and you subtract all of the pieces, the, you subtract like basically the part of it, which is in the, you know, let's see here, he does sum n, oh, goodness gracious, n equals one to k minus one, um, xn like this, so that's that, that's that ortho, ortho, orthogonal projection that I was talking about. And then XK is, well, what is it? It's, it's the, um, it's, it's, it's WK divided by the, the length of WK. And, um, and he proves, he proves here by induction that this gives you an ortho, um, orthogonal sequence, which is pretty neat, right? So, um, you're fine, I'm just, Distracted by the hall. So we, yeah, we were. We try to. Let me try to move it along here. I, I, um, I, I want to get to the. So that that induction is 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 fairly clear. I'll let you guys read it. Um, next up, he has a uh, the theorem four point three point four eight. Um, three point four eight. It's the Pythagorean theorem, right? Pythagorean theorem, formula rather, he calls it, which is that um, if we have orth orthogonal vectors in an inner product space, then the length of the sum um, um, let's see here, k equals 1 to n of x sub k, that length squared is equal to the sum of their lengths squared. And that I can prove pretty easily. So if you look at the inner product of this, Right, and I'll use a different index on the other one because it'll be important. J equals one to N 
of um, xj. Th th those are the same. I just changed the index for the sake of, um, I don't want to use the same index both places. It's, you, you understand why? Audric, are we good? Or am I needing to move you? No, you're good. You're good. Okay. So then by the properties of the inner product, we can pull out the sum over k and j from 1 to n. And we have the inner product of xk and xj, right? So that, that's literally, you know, the sum. So this is, what is this? Well, this is the sum over k and j of the Kronecker delta kj with the, the length of x, let's say, we'll keep the j um, squared. So that, that, that simplifies to just sum j equals 1 to n of the length of xj squared. But what I just calculated, right, is literally this right here anyway, right? So the length of the sum of the x's is the inner product of the sum with the inner product of the sum. So, so that's not bad. Now next up he has Bessel's equality and inequality. All right. So, whew, goodness. Wow, this section is much longer than I realized. All right, well, you know what? We're going to have to make this a twofer. I'm going to just, I'm going to stop right here. I think it's a pretty good place to stop. I'm sorry I didn't get more done today, um, but I'm, I'm getting tired and, you know, so sorry. But let's try to wrap up the chapter two homework by next time, and I... I will do my level best to have you guys the like review sheet for the um, for your test one, right? Which will cover chapters one and two, and um, if I have any, I'll try to look at your homeworks that you've turned in, see if I have anything to say to you, um, you know, that kind of thing. Does that seem fair? So, yeah. cool. And then um, so we'll keep chipping away at chapter three next week, and so I don't know, see how it goes. I'm going to turn off the camera now, and then you can say all those politically incorrect things you like to say when the camera's off, right, Audric? Audric's like, I'm not agreeing to this. <laughs>